while the last remainder of you are just getting ready to get comfortable and sit down, I'll just use a couple of pictorial images here just to remind you of a couple of things. This is the image we know for medical associations throughout the world. Pineal gland, brain's ventricles, spinal column, nervous system. This comes from old starfire ritual. It is what we associate today with medical institutions. What we also associate today with healing and emergency services is the Rosicrucius, the Red Cross. All of these old symbols are that old. And they exist today in medicine, in healing, in emergency services, and in everything to do with looking after people. Caneship. So let's look at it from the very beginning and let's look now at why Starfire was so important. Let's look at the principal and beneficial constituents that were eventually substituted by what became a chemical laboratory process. We've seen that Adam and Eve jointly called the Adame, Atabba and Eva. The earthlings were created clinically by Enki and Ninhursag. We're told in the books of old Shuma that, that this was done at a place called the House of Shimti. Shimti means breath, wind, life. Cain, according to Hebrew records and according to Shimerian records, was the son of Eve by Enki and not by Adam. His inherent Anunnaki blood was very, very potent. His wife was Lulava. She was the senior heiress to the matriarchal house of the dragon, the dragon queen. Lulava was a pure-bred Anunnaki stock. Her sons by Cain were Aton and Henoch, better known as Etana and Enoch. Shumerian records relate that King Etana of Kish partook of the plant of life in order to father his son, King Bali. The plant of life was directly associated with longevity and with Cainship, kingship. The plant of life was starfire. Starfire was associated with feeding the pineal gland and producing the hormonal secretions. The early starfire, just to recap, was not anything to do with the high priestesses. It was strictly Anunnaki, the female essence which they called the nectar of supreme excellence. The Anunnaki flower or lily was held to be the cup bearer. The cup bearer in grail law became the bearer of the grail. The grail was the Rosicrucius, which represented the starfire of the womb, the cup of the waters. The cup bearer, the transmitter of the rich food, as they called it, was called the Rose of Sharon. And this comes from an old Shumerian word, shah, which means orbit, and on, which related to light, the orbit of light. She was the rose of the orbit of light, the rose of Sharon. This significance is, in fact, venerated even in the Bible. In, in the Song of Solomon, lilies and roses, where the bride proclaims to the Messianic king, I am the rose of Sharon, I am the lily of the valleys. She is the bride of the starfire. The recipient king was considered to have become qualified for kingship when he reached a predestined state of enlightenment and, and achieved consciousness, a state when his aptitude for wisdom and leadership had reached the enhanced realm of kingship called the Malku. It was from the Mesopotamian word Malku that the Hebrews derived their word Malchus, which meant king and Malkut kingdom. Only in recent times, 1968, quite recently, did the hormonal secretion of the pineal gland become to totally isolated by the medical world. The product of this particular gland was called melatonin. Many of you are familiar with this, I know. Melatonin comes from the Greek melos and tosos, which mean black labor night worker.
those with high melatonin output actually react quite strongly against sunlight and are far better equipped to work at night. They are night operatives. They are melos tossos. Exposure to excess sunlight actually makes the pineal gland itself smaller. It lessens spiritual awareness, darkness, and high pineal gland activity, enhance keen intuition, knowledge of the subtle mind. They also reduce the stress factor. It's at this stage, it's interesting to note how the Christian church actually demolished totally the true significance of the starfire ritual because they moved it into the realm of Gothic legend. The ultimate holders of the Malku in the old tradition, the dragons and pendragons, were Draco. Their conditioning through high supplementary melatonin and other hormonal secretions meant that they were people of the night. They were people of the starfire. They were, according to the Christian church, princes of darkness who thrived on the blood of virgins who were vampires. <laughs> Draco. Dracul, Dracula. As we meet here tonight on this very night, Halloween, There is taking place, maybe it's over now, I doubt it very much knowing these guys, started about midday at Boston University, a symposium of authors and historians from around the world to which I was invited. The chairman, Professor Raymond McNally, has called the meeting to commemorate the centenary of the publication of Bram Stoker's famous book, Dracula. 1897 it was published. It's not generally known, but Bram Stoker, who wrote this book, was an officer of the sovereign and imperial court of the dragon. <coughs> He's also prominent as an officer in the Ordo Templi Orientis, the order of the Eastern Temple, the most scientific branch of any Templar organization in the world who were originally with the Essene Therapeutate Blood Brotherhood of Qumran. The motto of this order is God is man. A lot will be discussed at the meeting today, tonight, but the main reason for calling the meeting was not just to celebrate the publication of a book, was that Bram Stoker's own papers on this centenary are going to be published. These are the papers which actually tell us, finally, the ultimate codes beneath which the adventurous Gothic romance imparts the secrets of alchemi alchemical tradition from the early mystery schools. The book Dracula is a book of codes. And I might have something more to say about that if I get back here again and don't get bitten by a vampire. <laughs> so melatonin is created and manufactured by the pineal gland. It, it's activated through a chemical messenger called serotonin. This transmits nerve impulses across chromosome pairs at a point called meiosis, where the cell nuclei, the nuclei are halved, split, waiting to be combined with other halves upon fertilization. Melatonin enhances and boosts the body's immune system. Those with high pineal gland activity and secretion are less likely to develop cancerous diseases. High melatonin increases energy, stamina, physical tolerance. It's directly related to sleep patterns, and it has properties that operate through the cardiovascular system that keep the body very temperately regulated. Those of you who have high melatonin production will know that you are the night workers. This melatonin substance is actually the body's most efficient antioxidant. It has positive mental and physical anti-aging properties. 
the traditional symbol of kingship was gold. Pine resin, from which we get pineal, pineal, was what was used to make frankincense. Frankincense, as against gold for kingship, was the substance of priesthood, along with a third substance called myrrh, which was a gum resin used as a medical sedative and various other things. Myrrh was symbolic of death. In the ancient world, higher knowledge was identified as death, death, from which comes the word death. The words womb and tomb were absolutely identical. They were considered interchangeable and mutually supportive as roots to the higher knowledge. Womb and tomb, birth and death, roots to the higher knowledge. We know from the New Testament that Jesus, in fact, in the tradition of the old kings, was presented by the Magi with gold, with frankincense and myrrh. This, in the tradition, cements him, for those of us that may have doubted it, absolutely as a priest-king of the messianic dragon line. The pineal gland is impregnated by eternal ideas. It gives us the possibility of formulating our own conceptions. It's the organ of thought by which we learn to know and to change eternal ideas into earthly conceptions. There are those that believe that the pineal gland actually receives and sends vibrations, frequencies, thoughts, psychic phenomena, all transferred through the frequency of the pineal gland. It's been called the eye of wisdom, the eye of heightened self-awareness and inner vision. It's the key, say, the yogics, to intuitive knowledge, the act of knowing rather than simply learning. Illuminists and Rosicrucians referred to the pineal gland as ayin, A-Y-I-N, ayin. Now, this word has a number of definitions. It actually is, is a word used for eye. It can mean eye. The illuminist symbol was an eye within a triangle or an eye within a circle. The ayin, the eye. It also symbolizes, ayin symbolizes the root from which knowledge can actually come and become knowingness from absolutely nothing, from blackness, from darkness. It comes from the ayin. It comes from the blackness. It comes from the eye. A-N, A-Y-I-N, with a C or a K in front of it, was exactly how the name Cain was originally spelt. We just translated it to C-A-I-N and got rid of the Y in some latter-day English translations. The name Cain means he of the blackness of the eye. It's from Cain, from Cain, that we derive the word king. And interestingly, originally, it was spelt with a Q. Q-A-Y-I-N, Quain. So king is synonymous with queen. There's no difference at all. King and queen were simply the sovereign figure. And the line was transferred through the female. It is said that spiritual people can actually perceive with this, this inner eye. An eye which unlike mundane outer eyes, is not confused by physical pre presences. It, it, it actually reacts on seeing truth and, and knowing things. This is not new. This is the plain of Sharon. This plain of Sharon, which so many people have thought to be a sort of a field or something for hundreds of years, turns out to be the plane of the orbit of the light. It is the plane of knowing, a dimension which we can actually exist in, and those with higher pineal activity will exist more in that dimension, and this is why these people were fed the star fire. The Canaanite kings were the first pendragons of history. They were also of high, high Anunnaki substance, because the star fire increased their perception and general awareness, they were almost like gods themselves. Their stamina levels and immune systems were dramatically strengthened. Their anti-aging properties were immense. 
They had extraordinary lifespans. And I have read books and studied and tried to find out what these lifespans might have meant. People say there are codes in the numbers and all sorts of things. There is actually no secret or trick to them at all. They were real. They're not a code for anything. They lived a long, long time. In the Bible, we're told that during the lifetime of Noah and his sons, Jehovah issued the edict against the star fire. Thou shall not take the lifeblood. This is what we're told by the writers of the 6th century BC. But actually, once one looks at it historically, there's something a little wrong here, because this Jehovah God, this Enlil, would never at that moment in history, at about the time of Noah, have had any such authority to issue such an edict. So it rather looks as if the Bible writers have given us that story as if it happened at the time of Noah, but it probably happened a good deal later, after, after the family line had moved from Mesopotamia into Canaan. When did they do that? They did that at the time of Abraham. And remember what I said before, it's from the time of Abraham that suddenly the lifespans diminish. From that moment in time, once they move out of that area, the lifespans become pretty ordinary. However, in the line that they chose not to give us in the Bible, in the direct kingly succession from Cain, which we can actually follow through Mesopotamian and Egyptian history records, these high levels of age continued. So it's at that moment with Abraham, our dear patriarch, that actually the Davidic line suddenly got more and more normal. By the time it gets to King David, it suddenly becomes very special again. So it's terribly apparent that, 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 that this line from Abraham's time moves somewhere else and comes back in. And it does exactly that. It moves into Egypt. What happens is that the line that we follow from Abraham to David is not the line that we should be following in this kingly succession. We should be following during that moment in time the line that were the pharaohs of Egypt. And that's where David's history comes straight back from. The lowly shepherd who with his sling slew Goliath was actually born straight out of pharaonic Egypt. Contemporary historical records tell us that at the time of Abraham, at about 2000 BC, the whole of Ur, the great capital of Shuma, was sacked by an invasion. That suddenly gives us a reason for why on earth it would be that somebody like Abraham, the head of a, a very senior family line, would suddenly up and leave his own country with his father and the rest of his family. In fact, we can date it more precisely. It's not around 2000 BC. These records are actually dated and paralleled along with other events of the time, and the year was absolutely precisely 1960 BC. So we know exactly the, t the era of Abraham. So what really happened? What, what forced Terah and Abraham and Lot and the rest of the family to suddenly up and leave this great city which they were kings of? 1960 BC, we're told in the Shumerian and Akkadian records, that in came Amorites from Syria and Elamites from Persia. And it says, the quote, and they overthrew and the order they destroyed. Then like a deluge, all things together they consumed. Whereunto, O Shuma, did they change thee and the sacred dynasty from the temple they exiled. It's as clear as a bell. The sacred dynasty from the temple they exiled. It was at this stage of Shumerian history that the empire fell absolutely and totally. Abraham was forced to flee northwards. He fled from Ur into the city of Mari, north in the country, before going into, into Canaan. The records continue. Ur is destroyed. Bitter is its lament. The country's blood now fills its holes like a hot bronze in a mold. Bodies dissolve like fat in the sun. The temple, the dynasty, is destroyed. Smoke lies on our cities like a shroud. The Anunnaki have abandoned like migrating birds. Historically, this collapse of the Shumerian Empire, the moment when the Anunnaki 
abandon the place like migrating birds immediately follows the historical ransacking of Babylon by Jehovah. The story of the Tower of Babel. It fits the time frame absolutely. The story of Genesis relates to us that the people were hitherto said by Jehovah to be very good but were suddenly punished because of a very strange transgression that actually had never been previously described at all. This transgression was that they all spoke the same language, we're told, so God decided to confuse the language. In actual fact, their language was of course Shumerian, the oldest written language on earth. Their transgression, however, wasn't that they spoke the true language, the same language. In fact, Genesis tells us the transgression. And the transgression is that Jesus punished the people who had said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach to heaven and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad. Well, that's not actually made too much sense to anybody. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad. For that, Babel and the tower were smashed and the people were overrun. What the text actually used was a different word, and the word it used was Shem. Shem, from which comes Shuma, Shema. Let us make a Shem, it said, lest we be scattered abroad. And there, we suddenly discover that the word Shem was translated to name. Now, there is a reason for that, and we'll come back to it. It, it. it does have a bearing on the word name. But in actual fact, the word Shem came from the term Shamin, which means heaven. It derives from a root word, Shama, which means that which is highward. A Shem was, in fact, a monument, a highwood monument, in one of its respects, a highwood monument, a Shem was actually the monument from which we eventually obtained those things which we call church spires and steeples. The conical, tall, highwood monument, the Shem. However, a Shem was kind of more than that, because they weren't just big Shems, they were little Shems. And a Shem was highwood, and the full name of the word was Shemana, Shemana. And Shemana meant a highwood firestone. A highwood firestone. Firestone is the Shemana bit that's Anna. Shem is highwood, firestone is Anna. When firestone isn't described as firestone, what else does it mean? Anna is translated in Shumerian and Akkadian to a bright, shining metal. So Shemana, a highwood firestone, is a high wood, or high, bright, shining metal. The use of the word Shem is apparent in, in, in the names of people of the era. People, there was a, a god called Shemesh, the brother of Queen Enanna. Shemesh was called the shining one, Shemesh. Shem always meant shining when it was, was, was applied to people or to metallic things. Otherwise, it meant high wood. High wood, shining, meant the same things. It meant something in a high state, something that gleamed, something that was powerful. So back to Babylon. They're about to build their Shem to save themselves from being scattered abroad, but what do the historical documents tell us is against what the Bible tells us about this bit of the story? What they tell us we've just heard, is that hordes of invaders came into the country. Amorites came in, Elamites came in. All of these people suddenly invaded and sacked the country at that time. God says in the Bible, Jehovah, that God, I shall come down and confound the language of all the earth. Well, in fact, what the historical records tell us is precisely that. At Enlil's destruction, Invaders came in from all sides, and we knew not our own language anymore. The confusion of language was simply the influx of people from all around that suddenly had never been there before because the gates of the cities were opened, because Jehovah Enlil was for some reason a bit put out. It is then said to us that the invasion was a direct result of friction amongst the Anunnaki Grand Council because Enlil Jehovah had decided to assume the presidency 
because his father, Anu, was about to retire. The text continues, Anu went up to heaven, Enlil made the earth his subject, the seas enclosed with a loop were given to Enki. Now Enki was not happy about this because although he was the younger of the two sons, his mother was the elder of the two sisters of their father. And Enki said, I may have been born after him, but I am the son of the senior mother, therefore I hold the kingship. The actual quote continues, I am Enki, the great brother of the gods. I am he who has been born as the first son of Anu. Well, in the midst of all of this, Anu and Enlil, uh, Enki and Enlil are battling this stuff out with the council, and Enki's son, a god called Marduk, decides to settle everything, and he assumes control, and the people, while the battle between the two brothers is going on, decide to support Marduk. He seems to be on their side, and rather than have Enlil scatter them abroad, banish them, kick them out of their country, they will raise a Shem, a monument to Marduk. Let us build a Shem, lest we be scattered abroad. So this is all too much for Jehovah Enlil. He decides that having lost his own popularity to his brother Enki, that he's going to open up the gates of Shuma, let in the invaders from all sides, and the scribes record that then the terrible storm came, the culture was annihilated, the temple fell, the dynasty fell, and we saw a great confusion of tongues. The high gates, they said, the roads were piled with dead, the wide streets where the feasting crowds would gather lay scattered the bodies. In the streets the bodies lay, in the roadways the bodies lay, in the fields the bodies lay, no more dancers, now there are bodies laying in heaps, because Enlil has let in the invader. So all the work that had been done by the Anunnaki over thousands of years to build up this amazing civilization and to build up a, a line of kingship through star fire preservation and culture was destroyed in one fell swoop and the dynasty barely managed to escape and Abraham took the family up north and eventually went into Canaan. The Anunnaki at that stage, it is said, departed like migrating birds. So it appears that Enki and the others had gone. So who knows where? Maybe we'll find out. Enlil Jehovah and his minions appeared to hang on for a while. We're told that Abraham communicated with Enlil Jehovah in Canaan, calling him El Shaddai. Still the same thing, Il Kergal, Lord of the Mountain. But the book of Jasher then tells us something quite interesting. And this is another book that's left out of the Bible. In real terms, the God Jehovah, the Enlil God, last appears for the very final time in the Bible when he's there with Abraham trying to get him to slay his son Isaac. The book of Jasher, a book written long before the Bible, we know that because actually the records of ancient Babylon refer to the book of Jasher. Even the Bible refers to the importance of the book of Jasher, which means it was certainly written before it. The Bible tells us that Moses asked the Lord on the mountain what he should call him because he didn't know who he was, because he knew he couldn't be Enlil or Enki. The God that Moses met was not the God, he was the Lord, and Jasher tells us that he was the great Lord Jethro of Midian, the man to whom Enki's ancestors had given the tablets of destiny, which he was to pass on to Moses. Lord, high Jethro of Midian. Enlil had gone. Enki had gone. From the moment of Abraham's time, on this earthly plane, there is no further history of these deities, except in the mythology of their veneration. And what has perpetuated the mythology is the word Lord, because in their deputy stations, 
the seniors of the bloodline and the seniors of the priesthood took on the definition of Lord, and whenever the Lord came up in any record that the Hebrews copied from, they decided that that was God. From 1960 BC, Jehovah, Enlil, and Enki had gone. Departed, it said, like migrating birds, whatever that means. We can guess. So, for all that had occurred up to that point, a significant, significant change occurred in the starfire practice. There was no more starfire. The Anunnaki had departed like migrating birds. A substitute had to be found, and here we move in suddenly to a whole new chapter of history in the records because we're moving into the first drug company. <laughs> the substitute had to be found, but it appears that there is not a moment in the record where this appears to be a problem. It's all laid down, it's all predestined. There are a group of trained people whom the Anunnaki had designated master craftsmen. The first of these trained master craftsmen was Cain's psh, about sixth generation descendant, a guy called Tubal Cain. Now, any of you who might have or might know people involved in Freemasonry will know that Freemasonry venerates Tubal Cain. I have never in my lifetime found a Freemason who knows why they venerate Tubal Cain, but they do. Tubal Cain, sixth generation of King. Cain, the Cain, the king, was the father of Bilanos, who was the mother of Noah. Tubal Cain was the world's first master craftsman, trained by Anunnaki, and the Bible tells us that he was the greatest metallurgist, an artificer in all kinds of metals. The principle of the master craftsman was absolutely straightforward. The records are in no way in any doubt about this. Their job was to manufacture starfire gold of the gods. They had a rule, and the rule was simply this. To make gold, you must take gold. They knew what it meant. It's of particular interest, therefore, that when we move forward into the New Testament story, we discover that despite what it says in our modern-day English language translations, that Jesus' father, Joseph, in the earlier Greek editions of the Testament, tell us that he was a master craftsman. Jesus' father, Joseph, was a master craftsman. What happens when it gets translated into English? Well, our people think, what the hell is a craftsman? Carpenter of some sort, I suppose. He must be a carpenter. <laughs> so Joseph becomes a carpenter. <laughs> He's actually called a master craftsman, a great and skilled metallurgist. Not a woodworker at all. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, to revert back there, we go back to the time of Moses. Jehovah's now gone, Enlil's gone, Enki's gone. Jethro of Midian, the great Lord, is now in charge of everything. He holds the tablets of destiny. These are the tablets of cosmic knowledge left by the Anunnaki. Jethro appoints a certain Bezalel, the son of Uri Ben-Hur, to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. Bezalel, it tells us, was a great and worthy goldsmith. He was, it says, a master craftsman. He was in charge of constructing the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. In detailing how Bezalel should manufacture various crowns and rings and bowls and a candlestick and golden things galore, it tells us also that amongst his instructions was the making of something called shoebread. Shoebread. Without any explanation, the deed is done. We have him making the bowl and the candlestick and the shoe bread and everything else, but nobody tells us what shoe bread is. It's actually said to be the shoe bread of the covenant. That's his description, the shoe bread of the covenant. 
It's identified with the word covenant. The word covenant is identified these days with contractual agreements, with legal documents, with covenants, but actually it meant to eat bread with. The Lord's Prayer, which was established much about that time and resurrected later on in Christian times, makes a point. Give us this day our daily bread. It is taken to mean sustenance of some sort. It, in actual fact, was very specifically related to the shewbread of the covenant, the shewbread which, in fact, was one of the constituent followers of Starfire. <clears throat> Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, takes us back again to shewbread. It doesn't specify it by name this time, and it says, take the white flour and bake the cakes thereof. Put pure frankincense in each row. Now, the word flour that we have today is actually a misnomer um, because later on in the book it actually uses the word powder. And if one goes back to the original text, the same word was used each time uh, for some reason or other they decided to tell us flour because we're talking about making bread. Both occasions the word is powder. So they're taking this powder, they're putting frankincense on it after they've made it. They're making starfire substitute. The mystery school records tell us more precisely that this white powder was gold. So suddenly, not only is red black and red gold, but now white is gold. This is pretty significant because in the book of Exodus, Exodus it tells us that Moses took the golden calf which the Israelites had made, burnt it in the fire, ground it to a powder, strewed it upon the water, and gave it to the children of Israel to drink. This is where the word powder is used correctly. But firing gold, he put it into the fire and produced white powder. Firing gold does not produce powder. Firing gold produces molten gold. So, what was this magical powder that was fed to the Israelites? Is there a way of transforming metallic gold into a white powder, like Moses was said to have done? Well, in actual fact, <coughs> there is. Because to make gold, it said you must take gold. And white powder, it said, was gold. And the starting point for gold is gold. So to make the white powder, you begin with gold. And the story goes round in a circle, and we move into a particular avenue of early alchemical practice. Gold is noble, they said. Gold is truth. Through the regular use of the Anunnaki starfire, which was itself called the gold of the gods, the recipients were said to have moved into the realms of heightened awareness, consciousness, because of the inherent melatonin and serotonin. This was the realm of advanced enlightenment, which they called the plane of Sharon, the plane of the orbit of light, and the starfire was said to be the route to the light. <clears throat> so, this mundane, heavy darkness can be transferred into light, into gold. And this became the root of alchemical practice thereafter. Shoebread, the Hebrews called it. Shaffer food, the Egyptians called it. It was the food of the Egyptian messiahs. And this is quite interesting to see this word coming up in dragon court records, the Egyptian messiahs. We associate messiahs with the Hebrew line, don't we, and pharaohs with the Egyptian line. In actual fact, they called them messiahs because they were anointed with the Messa, the fat of the Messa. They were the dragons. And so suddenly we're beginning to see that the David line does come back out of Egypt. It doesn't come straight from Abraham in the line that we're told. We can forget just about everybody that the Bible tells us was between Abraham and David. The line goes out and comes back in again. So, we have white powder, we have shewbread. What does that remind us of? It reminds us of something else in the Bible, another strange food substance that suddenly appeared at around the time of Moses. The people knew, no, knew not what it was, it said. They thought it was snowing. This divine and wonderful food, what was it, they said? What was it? It is manna. If we read... 
Josephus Antiquities of the Jews, he actually explains that, that the particle manna, the M-A-N, man, from manna, in the Jewish language means what is it. That's all it means, what is it. Manna means what is it. This strange, mysterious food, the secret, the hidden manna, means what is it. In actual fact, the interesting thing about the word manna is that if one looks back at the earliest documents, we find that even what is it, manna, is an abbreviation of Shemana. Shemana, remember, was highwood firestone. What is it? It is highwood firestone. What is highwood firestone? When the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna because they knew not what it was. Moses said, this is the bread. The manna is then described to be white. The manna is then said to be like snow. The manna is said to taste sweet, like honey. And they called it bread. When the Ark of the Covenant was completed, Moses' brother Aaron was said to have placed an omer full of manna into the ark. And the New Testament book of Revelations continues the story. It says, to him that overcometh, I will give the hidden manna. I will give the white stone. And in the stone will be a name, a new name written, which no one knoweth except he who receiveth it. Much later in Grail Law, in European Grail Law, and we're now moving forward to the 1200s, comes this quote. Around the end of the stone is an inscription in letters, and it tells the name and the lineage of those be they maids or boys. Those are the, they who make the journey to the grail. And nobody can read the inscription on the stone except they whom it is for, and then it vanishes. So there's a direct parallel here between something from the book of Revelation and something from the grail law of the Middle Ages. And it refers to a stone, and it refers to whiteness, and it refers to a name. And the word Shem, if we remember, was translated into name. Let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad. In actual fact, name is equivalent because of its use here. Highwood, Firestone, Shemana was manna, and this was associated with a name, and the name was the lineage. The name was the grail. In Chartres Cathedral in France, there is a statue of the great priest king Melchizedek who, who offered the bread and the wine to Abraham. It's a very, very unique statue, this, because all other statues... Of, of priests offering bread and wine, which was a communion custom, are showing them offering bread and offering wine. But Melchizedek's statue from the time of Abraham is immensely different because he is offering a chalice, and in the chalice is the bread. It's in it. It's not separate. It's called bread and it's called wine, but actually all one sees there is bread. And this is very interesting. And the reason that it's interesting, as the Templar records tell us, is that it depicts and describes the very moment when the wine, the redness, the starfire, the blood of the chalice was substituted for the new bread. The time of Melchizedek, suddenly it was starfire no more, it was manna. It was suddenly not the natural product anymore, it was suddenly a manufactured product, and it was white gold. This bread, it was said, was used to feed the light body as against the physical body, and it makes a point of telling us that. As far back as 2200 BC, they're actually talking about the secretions of glands in the human body. The pharaohs, in their travels, as written in the Book of the Dead and in other European archives, keep telling us that at each stage of a pharaoh's journey, he is still asking, what is it? What is it? Shemana. It is the manna, it is the gold, it is the white food. In the alchemical tradition, something called the philosopher's stone is said to be that which translates base elements into gold. This is deemed to be the case in the higher metallurgical sense, and also in the spiritual sense of enlightenment, moving the mundane person into a higher state of being, transferring his lead into gold. So, the rule was to make gold, you must take gold. There are two distinctly different forms of gold. There is the straightforward metal that we know, 
gold. We all know what that looks like. But there is also a higher state of gold, the gold that is in a different dimension of perceived matter, the white powder of gold that suddenly doesn't look like metal anymore. It's the hidden manner. It's become hidden because it doesn't look like what it is. It's still gold, and its secret was known by the master craftsman. In the alchemical document called the Rosarium Philosorum, the hidden stone was described in terms of geometry. Make a round circle of the man and the woman, draw out of this a square, out of the square a triangle, make a round circle, you will have the stone of the philosophers. We all recognize that as Vituruvian man, the drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, the square, the man. They say this is the philosopher's stone. It's not the philosopher's stone, but geometrically this is a representation. <coughs> I tried to find out from numerous people exactly what the Philosopher's Stone represented. Was it really a stone? Was the stone a symbol for something? Uh, was it actually a stone because it was metal, even though metal is metal and not mineral? And, and I was told a very strange answer, and perhaps I'll learn more in time, but I was told that the concept of the stone is rather like the half cup of water. To some of us, the cup is half empty, and to others, the cup is half full. So is a stone a pebble, or is a stone a gem? And our own intuition will lock us straight into one of those things, and there will be those of us who are positive and those of us who are negative, and the positive people will find the root of the stone, I'm told. In the Grail Romance of Parsifal, written in the Middle Ages again, it is said of the Temple Knights of the Grail Castle, they live by virtue of a stone most pure. If you do not know its name, now learn it. It is called Lapit Exilis. By the power of this stone, the phoenix is burned to ashes, but the ashes speedily restore it to life, and the phoenix thus molts and thereupon gives out a brilliant light so that it is suddenly as beautiful as before. Now, lots of people have, have wondered about lapis exilis because it appears to be a play on words. It combines two things, it seems. Lapis excalis means stone from the heavens. Lapis elixis, or elixir, is likened very often to the philosopher's stone itself, um, the stone by way of which base elements are transformed into higher states of being in, into gold, realistically or symbolically. Either way, whichever we're looking at, whether we're talking about stones from heaven or, or elixir stones, we're talking about Shemana. We're talking about the heavenly stone, the highwood fire stone, the manna that was the substitute for star fire. So the Parzival Allegory lies in the description, it seems, that the phoenix is burned to ashes and appears again in a light as bright and beautiful as ever before. But what's a phoenix? What's a phoenix? It's a bird, we answer. The Bennu bird. No. The word phoenix is far, far older than any mythology about birds. The word phoenix is that the most ancient Phoenician, and the word phoenix means red gold. Starfire. This is the story of the starred fire that will turn things, no matter how they're destroyed, into something brighter and more beautiful than before. The interesting thing about the starfire symbolism is that there are still, within certain orders, starfire rituals carried out today. They're, of course, wholly symbolic, just like Freemasonry is and ceremonies, and most of the time people don't know what the hell it is that they're doing. <laughs> because they tell us the secrets have been lost, and that one day, if we keep performing the rituals, the secrets will be returned. And once they are here, we at least have the ceremonies practiced and can get going again. Well, one of these rituals, in fact, uses to represent starfire. Quite often it's the cross and the circle, but, but one of them, and this is an interesting one, this is a ninth degree ceremony 
um, from, from one of the Templar orders, and it's starfire symbolism. And again, this can be traced way, way back, um, back beyond records of Hebrew law, it, and it's very much associated with Hebrew law because they have two triangles to represent starfire. One is, is a, a, an ordinary upright triangle, and they say that this is the triangle of gold, which will become light. And they also have another triangle, which somebody else carries around, and this triangle is turned up the other way. And they say this triangle represents water. It represents blood. It represents matter. So this triangle here represents the spirit. It represents the light. It represents the gold. And this one represents the water and the blood. It represents matter. And when they've been through the ceremony, they interlock these triangles together, and they get that. And it is called the gem. When it's finally interlocked together, the spirit with the matter, it is called the gem. Now, quite what our degree is involved here, I'm not absolutely sure. But these same people have said to me before, a stone can be a pebble or a stone can be a gem. So clearly, this allegory of starfire symbolism is very much locked into early philosophers' stone heritage. Old Alexandrian texts call it the stone of paradise. This is interesting stuff because it carries on with something that gets more and more stunning once we learn about modern metallurgy and, and, and aspects of alchemy because we're now with an Alexandrian text that goes back to BC years and it says that the philosopher's... No, it doesn't call it the philosopher's stone. It calls it the stone of paradise. The white stone of paradise, the stone of the name, when placed on the scales can outweigh its quantity but when covered to dust, even a feather will tip the scales against it. It's interesting stuff, isn't it? We have something that can outweigh itself on the scales, but when covered to dust, when turned to powder, even a feather can be heavier than it. Those of you who have seen the David Hudson video will get an inkling of where this appears to be going now. Is there a formula for this, I said? Is there a formula somewhere here? Something that they worked to? And the answer was, yeah, of course there were formulas, there were mathematical formulas, there, there, were, there, there were recipes and all sorts of things, but the formula upon which the whole of this process is based on is this. It's very simple. Naught equals plus one plus minus one. Naught equals plus one plus minus one. Now that's very straightforward, isn't it? Because one plus minus one does actually equal naught. Very straightforward, and I thought, well, this is pretty good stuff for the cleverest people in the world to, to have worked that out. But they then said, think about it. This is a sum that can only work when it is a sum. It can never work when it's applied to reality. If you have a plus something, a plus one of these, you can't add a minus one of these to it and turn out nothing because it's still there. You could actually minus it and put it behind your back and pretend it's nothing, but actually it's still something. So the, 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 the sum suddenly becomes daunting. This easy sum became some, becomes something quite impossible. You cannot add minus one of something to a plus of itself to end up with nothing. And they smiled and said, can't you? <laughs> well, it seems that you can. And in fact, they then begin talking once again about the plane of Sharon, the plane of the orbit of light. Because something which is actually truly and absolutely nothing to us is very simply something which we can't see. It doesn't actually mean it doesn't exist. It's not hidden. It's not put somewhere else. We can't see it. Therefore, it is nothing. But actually, we're surrounded all the time by a lot of something that is nothing. 
We are simply not aware of it. We do not perceive it. We cannot see it, touch it, or taste it. Doesn't mean it's not there. It just means it's in a different dimension. This, they say, to us is nothing. We can have plus it, we can add to that, minus it, and we can move it into another dimension. When it is in that other dimension, even a feather will tip the scales against it, because not only can we make it weigh less than itself, we can actually make it physically disappear. Well, this is interesting again, and it would have meant little to me unless I'd seen the David Hudson video, because once again, we're straight back into exactly what these experiments showed us. That, that, it, that in fact, one can take metal, one can turn metal into white powder, one can actually make it weigh a lot more than itself, like it said in the Alexandrian text, or one can make it so that it, even a feather tips the scales against it. Or it can actually disappear totally from sight. Doesn't mean it's not gone because you can bring it back. It has simply moved into the plane of Sharon. The metal that we commonly know as white gold suddenly becomes of importance in this now because when you go back to the early text, not only are we talking about starfire and red gold, but we're suddenly talking about white gold. Not just white powder, but white gold. Now, white gold today is something which we use in jewelry, uh, uh, and generally it's made by taking a metal called palladium and mixing it with ordinary gold. Palladium is a very hard, white, non-tarnishing metal, and it belongs to the platinum group. It was first discovered in Brazil and California in the Urals in 1803. Other hard metals of this same platinum group are iridium, osmium, rhodium, ruthenium. And because of their ultimate strength, these hard white metals are used in all sorts of precision industries. They're, they're, they're used to make machine bearings. They're used in surgical and optical instruments. They're used in crucibles and thermocouples and all manner of things right down to pen nibs. The little silver bit dipped on the end is one of these platinum metals. Palladium is said to have been discovered in 1803. Iridium, osmium, rhodium are given precisely the same date. Ruthenium followed in 1843, but according to the old Sumerian records, these dates are actually wrong because they knew about them then. What we have in all of our encyclopedias are the dates of rediscovery. Like many secrets of old, they can disappear for hundreds, maybe thousands of years because somebody has decided to contrive history against them. They actually comprised the very metallic group which in looking at the word, because they believed it couldn't be anything else, historical writers have termed tin because the Sumerians described the shining white hard metal of the Shemana, the highwood firestone of the white gold. When learning about the things that they used to do with this, it is quite apparent that it wasn't tin, because tin would never be strong enough to, to make some of the stuff they were using this for. They were actually doing the equivalent of hip joint replacements with highwood firestone. From these firestones, they achieved the state called highwood. Suddenly, we're beginning to learn that it doesn't just mean something that goes up. It doesn't just mean something that shaped highwood. It's actually now being referred to in, in the master craftsman's documents as the highwood state. The highwood state. What is the Highwood state? What is it? What is it? Manor. What is it? It is the metal in the Highwood state. Today, it falls into a category that we call high spin metallurgy. Only by understanding the science of high spin metallurgy one, can one take something and add to it its equivalent of nothing and apply the principle of naught equals plus one plus minus one. 
this is the point at which one could branch right off and go into hours and hours about alchemy and turning metals into gold and all of this sort of stuff. The important thing to recognize here is not that. This is not a lesson on medieval alchemy. It's, it, it's for us to appreciate that there were metals used at the time that they were maneuvering the master craftsman into a highwood state, a high spin state, a state at which the electrons react differently to they do in the normal metallic state. And at that point, we're actually moving the metal into another direction, into a high wood state, into a high spin state. The high wood, fire stone, fire stone, Anna, Shem, Anna. It is hard, it is shining. It is probably a metal of the platinum group. Through sequences of heating and cooling, it has been proved now that one can actually take these metals and cause them to rise and fall hundreds of times their optimum weight and weigh down to less than nothing. We are moving them then into the plane of Sharon. So this is the story really of the succession, not from Adam, to David and to Jesus, but the succession from Cain to David and Jesus. And unfortunately, poor old Adam wasn't part of that program, but Eve was. Cain was the Cain. It wasn't a name. He was the Cain, the kin, the king, the blood relative. The blood relative of who? The Bible tells us that Eve says, I have gotten him from the Lord, and the Lord was Enki. Enki means archetype. Now it is very interesting. There are many words, many names historically given to people because we knew what they became. We just give them as back titles to people, sort of posthumously, and, and we know them by that name because that is what they became. At the time this was happening, they were calling Enki the archetype. It wasn't something that people thousands of years later decided to label him. They called him that then, the archetype. We have the beginning of the succession which created not only the kingly line of Judah, but the original kingdoms of Egypt, in both of which countries they carried out the star fire practice. The only difference with Egypt was that they took it onto a mundane level and introduced the scarlet women, the hierogile, the harlots, the whores, the dearly beloved. And eventually, even the Egyptian metallurgists moved in because, in fact, the star fire of the dearly beloved didn't match that of the Anunnaki when it finally came to playing the kingly game. What they did was to work out the most logical thing in the world. Instead of feeding you these secretions directly to give you more of them, instead of giving you a hormone replacement or a, a hormone supplement, why don't we actually do something far more clever? Why don't we feed you with something that will make your own personal glands produce far more of this hormone secretion? That way, you're producing it for yourself you don't have to be taking a supplement from somewhere else. There are today chemical companies in the organotherapy industry who can and will supply melatonin, serotonin, and these sort of hormone supplements. There is an immense difference between these, which are made from the desiccated glands of dead animals, to that which comes from the human live animal. Even if they came from live ordinary animals, it would be better. These melatonin and serotonin supplements are taken from dead animals, at which point the secretion has been failed from the moment of death. It begins to die pretty well immediately. By the time you get it desiccated and sold to you in its bottles or pills or whatever, it is pretty well as useless as taking a chocolate biscuit. You've actually got to take quite a lot of it. It is not live 
melatonin, it is dead melatonin. This, with a bit of luck, with a bit of luck, might help you through jet lag. It might help you stay up a little bit that later on that night that you've got to work a bit harder. It might give you a little edge on all sorts of things by which your body's general metabolism might have been collapsing and needs a bit of a boost. It will not actually give you long life or anti-cancer or any of the things that the, that the original Starfire or, or Substitute did. So instead of taking the stuff, they produced the first, the first manufactured drug, the first supplement. It actually charged, charged your glands to make them produce more of these hormones. And what was that made out of? It was made out of metal. It was manna. It was shemana. It was what is it? It was shefa food. It was whatever you like to call it, shoe bread. But it was made out of gold and it was made out of platinum. And tests have now proved the difference between the two. There is no doubt whatsoever that the old records were correct. Because when they tell us what the white gold did is against what the red gold did, this now proves out scientifically that the red gold, the gold, affects the pineal gland absolutely. The white gold, the platinum group metals, affect the pituitary gland. By taking the substances from both, you will be producing both melatonin and serotonin. Serotonin feeds the pineal and produces more melatonin, so by taking both of them, you are going to end up taking from the plant of life, and just as Jehovah said in Genesis, Behold, he's becoming like one of us. I think that'll do for now. Let's have a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've, we've still got a little bit of time left, so if, if anybody wants to ask any specific questions, there's a, a microphone at the back, I'm told, and uh, you can talk to me from there. If I know it, I'll answer it. I was fascinated by your talk, and I uh, had recalled a few what I think are some tantalizing fragments that uh, uh, support a lot of uh, what you told us tonight. Um, what I was curious to know, I, I know that you're the prior of uh, the Celtic Church, or I'm not exactly sure of your office or what is re how to refer to it, but I wanted to know if, that you, uh, if you were aware that the Catholic Church in Yelm is dedicated to St. Columban, and I think that's an interesting um, uh, correspondence. <laughs> you know, that you, the Catholic Church here the, is dedicated to St. Columban. The Roman Columban. Catholic Church is called St. Mm. Columban's, yeah. Interesting. So, so I think you're uh, in the right place. I guess. <laughs> that, that, that is interesting. There's a, there, there is an interesting story behind that, actually. That what, what I am is prior of the sacred kindred of St. Columba, which is, in fact, the royal ecclesiastical seat of the Celtic Church. Uh -huh. uh, the sacred of King, uh, the kindred of Saint Columba, was the Celtic priesthood of royal blood. So only the relatives uh -huh. of the kings and queens of, of Scots and Northern Ireland were, were within the sacred kindred. So I'm Britain's prior of that now. Yes. Um, the Columba thing and the Catholic thing is terribly interesting. Saint Columba, the great leader of the Celtic Church, died in the year 579, and without wasting. I think something in just under three weeks, the Pope from Rome had sent St. Augustine over to Britain to try and take over and demolish the Celtic Church on behalf of the Church of Rome, because he said there are a lot of pagans. They drink wine and dance the drum music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anyway, so St. Augustine comes over to Britain and he proclaims himself Britain's first Archbishop of Canterbury and he manages to kick the, Catholic Church, uh, the Celtic Church pretty well out of England and moves it into Wales and Scotland and Ireland and that's essentially where it's been ever since. What is interesting is that because the Celtic Church's popularity was retained century after century after century, it actually got to the point where the people of Britain and the people of the Western Christian world generally had kind of forgotten that St. Augustine and the Roman Church and St. Columba and the Celtic Church were the bitterest of enemies because all of a sudden these are just people from the dim distant past that are called Saint something or other and saints are just people of the Christian Church and so suddenly from about 1500, which is kind of before any churches would have been built over here, but only, you know, a century or so before, from about 1500, the Catholic Church and the Church of England both started to, to change some of their church dedications to St. Columba. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a trick they're pulling on us, actually. He's, he's not a, a Catholic <laughs> saint at all. <laughs> uh, you uh, referred to the word uh, Quinn, Q-U-I-N, I believe. Did you? Q U A. Oh, Q U A N. No, sorry, Q A Y I N. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's something else. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, well, uh, questions are limited, so I'll turn the mic over. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, regress a bit. I was wondering, okay, Jehovah uh, s said to Noah, no more, no more drinking of the blood as such, um, and, but nothing, nothing significant happened until Abraham. Is there anything in the dragon records of, 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 of a flood or anything? Is there anything to support the Bible and, and it, it, like this, this huge event by the Bible? And no, then there's not nothing. really. I mean, there are, there, there, what, what seems to happen with the Old Testament, um, certainly with the, the earlier books, not so much as history progresses and it becomes real history, but, but this early stuff, I mean, they're, they're writing this up from thousands of years before. So the books, the books of Moses, uh, Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy are, are books of pretty ancient history. And what seems to have happened within them is that there are lots of events that actually are based on substantial things, but have got out of sequence. Uh, even the flood itself, um, I I I in true history, that the flood has nothing to do with the Noah period. It actually comes before the Adam period. It's just got switched around because it suits the better novel. You know, the story is better. It has a nice <laughs> flow. Um, but, but the blood thing, you see, that th this, this rule is, is given to the time of Noah. But actually, so is the flood. And that the, the flood is historically the, the, the best known example of something that is totally out of, of chronological context. Um, so the point that I make is probably the blood thing is equally, uh, which actually leaves Noah a little bit out in the cold with having nothing much to do with anything too much. Um, what it does is to bring Abraham more fully into the picture because in essence the, 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 the story of, of, of the blood and, and, and the sort of beginning of the movement towards a, a, a Jewish faith that supported Jehovah really comes from the Abraham time, not from the Moses and Noah era before. Um, we're, we're presented with these people as if they were actually Jews and Hebrews, but they, they certainly weren't. Um, I mean, the word Jew simply comes from the country name of Judea, um, and the word Hebrew comes from the name Heber, who was, I think, the great-grandfather of Abraham. So there's no way that people like Noah and, and all the others before were actually Jews, Hebrews, or anything at all. Um, the story of the Jewish faith seems to begin with Abraham, and that's why he is the great patriot father. So Noah just wasn't important. <laughs> Noah wasn't well, important. Well, he, he I, I mean, clearly he was important to, to somebody. I suspect his wife loved him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, the important thing about Noah was that his wife was Bilanus, who was the daughter of Tubal Cain. And the importance of Noah was that, that, that um, whether he liked it or not, he fathered the strain, the important strain from the Cain line that came in after him. So, so what I'm really saying is that nothing really is important in the line from Seth 
to Noah, the line then becomes important from Noah onwards because it's now moved in with this other line that was the key line, but then it drifts away again and it comes back again a little before David from, in from Egypt. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Very illuminating. Thank you so much. Um, had the origin of the theory of the Jews' claims of being God's chosen people had anything to do with their being privy to the um, starfire rituals and its subsequent knowledge of longevity? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the problem with things like God's chosen people, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to know where things like this begin. What, what you have is... is an edict which is credited to a point in time, but it's actually only being written up today. It is said that then we became God's chosen people. I was just wondering um, if in your um, but research... But yeah, you see, what, what they would have had was, was access to the Tablets of Destiny. They would have had um, access to early Kabbalah. They would have had access to, to Starfire Ritual and all of these things. Um, so on that basis... What, what seems to have occurred here is something which occurs throughout the Old Testament. There are many, many, many references where the word God is used. Not Jehovah particularly, or Lord, but where the word God is used. Now, the difficulty with the word God is that the original word that the, this God word was translated from was Elohim, or, or variations of that, and this was a plural word. Um, it was actually a, a non-gender word. Elohim meant gods, it equally meant goddesses. It didn't mean the or a god. So, so in essence, what, what one could presume here is that what they were saying was, we were the chosen people of the gods and goddesses. Not that god's chosen people. We were the chosen people of the gods, and clearly they were. We know that Jethro of Midian had the, um, the, the Tablets of Destiny. Uh, we know also that the sons of, uh, uh, of Lamech, Tubal Cain and his brothers, inherited the Tablets of Destiny. So we know that these things were held in that family line. Um, the problem was that they forsook them all for the sake of a faith, a faith of fear, which actually forbade them to use this knowledge. And it was lost for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but there were Kabbalists and secret societies and all sorts of mystery mystical schools who, who continued the practices and continued with the knowledge. But they had very, very little to do with the average Hebrew. The average Hebrew was still wandering around trying to find a territory and wondering why his God didn't like him very much. Thanks. And um, it, it, it rather seems that because of that, although their family spawned the greatest kingly line in history, the rest of its history doesn't amount to very much. Well, can one infer that um, the Hebrew religion is an, an outgrowth of their relationship with the Anunnaki? I think the Hebrew religion, uh, as it is, is an outgrowth from fear of Jehovah. Um, st strictly that. I mean, it is a faith founded on fear, just like the Christian religion which followed it. Um, you know, if one had to sum up what is the ultimate basis of the Christian religion, it is that it holds us all in fear of the unknown. And only by, again, abiding by the dogma of God's chosen people, whom we don't call Jews but we call bishops, can we be actually saved from this unknown because they hold the key. They are the priests, they are the bridges uh, between us and the unknown. The, 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 the fact is that um, I'm not too sure how much of the unknown they know about. Thank you. <laughs> the family of Windsor has a very strange history. It's it's the one house in British history, I suppose, apart from the House of Stuart, but, it, but in English terms, that didn't actually come along with swords and fight their way to the throne. The, 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 the Anglo-Saxons came and knocked the Celts out, and the Normans came and knocked out the Anglo-Saxons, and 
the Plantagenets dealt with them, and then the Tudors won a battle. And most of England's changes of dynasty have happened because of force of arms. Somebody has wiped out the dynasty before and taken over. The House of Stuart was brought in from Scotland because England was in such a mess, and Elizabeth was deemed not to have a, a child, Queen Elizabeth I, so her nearest relative was the King of Scots at the time, absolute rubbish. Her nearest rel relative was Edward Seymour, Lord Beecham, whose heir now should actually be the King of England. The Scots were brought in for one reason, and that was to get rid of the House of Stuart, because the House of Stuart were allowing freedom of worship. And that wasn't actually liked by the English very much because they'd become totally and utterly Anglican and there were people up in the north of the country able to be Catholics or Jews or whatever they wanted and the people had no such right of individual choice. So we'll bring the King of Scots down to England and then depose them and that's exactly what they did. But the House of Hanover came in by government whim. And the beauty of the House of Hanover, which became the House of Windsor, was that they didn't speak any English. <laughs> so in 1714, George of Hanover, an elector of, 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 of Hanover, a small kingdom I I in Germany, was invited to become king of Britain. He couldn't speak English, he couldn't write English, he couldn't read English. He was king of England for 17 years and spent about 10 months in the country. And so that was jolly useful. And at that moment in time, politics took over English kingship. Um, various laws were passed which took away the rights of sovereigns. So that the Hanoverian family, given no rights to be anything very much at home, from the time of George II to the time of Queen Victoria, decided that a jolly good plan was to build up an empire abroad. Um, because that would keep them out of having to worry about people in Britain. They could go off to Africa and India and slaughter a few people and build up an empire. So that's what they did, and it was jolly good fun for a while, and it put a lot of pink bits on the map. But we have a rule in Britain, and the rule says that the royal line must succeed through the mail. This is not old Egyptian or Hebrew law, this is England now. <laughs> it must succeed through the mail line. So Queen Victoria of the House of Hanover is a woman. Hmm, interesting. She marries Prince Edward of Saxe-Coburg, another German prince, and the house immediately from the time of their son, Edward, becomes the House of Saxe-Coburg. Now, there's a parallel here because this has happened again with our other Elizabeth. The queen marries, the family takes on the name of the husband. We now have the house of Saxe-Coburg. We historians call it the house of Hanover Saxe-Coburg, just so that we don't forget. In 1917, in the middle of the um, First World War, King George V thinks, well, our family is not too popular at the moment because actually the people are beginning to remember that we're German and, and to be honest, if they get hold of any letters or correspondence, they see that we've never talked a word of English in Buckingham Palace to this day. They spoke and wrote in German. <laughs> so he said, I know what we can do. Here's a jolly good idea. Edward I, um, back in the 12th century, was um, called Edward Windsor. Why don't we change our name to Windsor? That's a jolly good English name. And we've got a castle called Windsor Castle and so we'll call ourselves Windsor. So the Windsor House was born just out of a change of name, but it didn't make it any less the House of Hanover, Saxe-Coburg, Windsor. From that moment on, its story wasn't too happy because poor old Edward, King Edward VII, was in court, court more than he was on the throne. Um, debts to gambling houses, debts to prostitutes, debts to his tailors and cabinet makers and everybody else. He wasn't a very clever guy. And we, we sort of fumble through a couple of kings and we get to Edward VIII and here's the beginning of a wonderful story because Edward VIII is forced to vacate the throne. Um, we are told because he was going to marry or had married Mrs. Wallace Simpson, an American lady. And this wasn't on because she wasn't exactly a German princess and we couldn't have that. 
Um, well, in actual fact, there was a lot more to it because Mrs. Simpson had nothing to do with that story at all. She was bigamous and Edwards was already married to a woman in Canada. Um, the relevance was, and the film clips are now beginning to be released, is that Edward was under promise from Hitler in the Second World War to be the person who would be left as the only operative king in the Third Empire of Germany. He would be paid by the German state, he would be upheld by the German state, and he would effectively be a junior king under the German regime. Edward was forced to abdicate because of this. Mrs. Simpson was the scapegoat. And Edward VIII moves into history in his den of Arcadia and balls and parties and everything else that we know about the ostentatious spending of that part of the family. His poor brother, Albert, then has to become king, but Albert hasn't been to a very good school at all. Nobody ever thought he was going to be king, and he had a stutter, and he was impotent, and he had various problems, but he was going to be king. So George got the job as being king, and it was quite apparent that he was not going to be a very effectual king. Um, they decided that one way to make him better was that King Albert didn't actually sound that good, um, so we may as well call him King George VI. That sounds much stronger and more Hanoverian. That's better. We'll call him that. So they called him King George VI, and enabled to stabilize the position, because now the world is rocked against Germany. It is known. The truth about Edward VIII is known. Um, People are being sent across to, to, to Germany to try and pull out records and correspondence between the, the Nazi leaders and Edward. And it is decided that the way to save the royal family is to marry into a completely different breed. And we get the marriage to Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who is of Scottish heritage, and they played the Scottish card to its hilt. Actually, you have to go back seven generations to find anybody in her um, paternal or maternal family that wasn't born in the middle or south of England. Um, the Scottish title was ancient, but, but her, 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 her father was a member of the Royal Stuart Society and did, in fact, resign from that society so that she could marry the king. What then happened, of course, was that there were two daughters, um, both born through artificial insemination. We have Elizabeth and we have Margaret. And we end up back in a situation which is not now dissimilar from that which applied before, because we now have a woman inheriting the throne of Britain. If a woman inherits the throne of Britain, just as Victoria found out, the house has to change its name to the name of her husband. That's why Hanover became saxe coburg However, this is very strange because Elizabeth is now going to marry somebody who hasn't got a name. She's not queen yet. Her father, George, is still alive. And in 1946-7, she is now going to marry somebody who we know as Philip of Greece. We are told today that he's Philip of Greece. I have more Greek blood in my American jacket than Philip has in his body. <laughs> The story behind Philip was a very straightforward one. Philip's grandfather applied for a job in the Danish press. And the job said, please apply anybody who would like to become king of Greece. Anyway, his grandfather got the job. He was born of, of, of Germanic Danish blood. But he got the job of king of Greece. He was a reasonable king but his son, Andrew, Philip's father, was a different kettle of fish. Andrew wasn't much good at anything, and Andrew actually managed to get himself charged with treason in Greece for organizing a very strange military campaign against the Turks from which he fled the field, and one and a half million Greeks lost their lives. He and his generals were charged with treason, and this is all going on at about the time that Elizabeth is going to marry his son. The British Foreign Secretary has to send out a gunboat to rescue the family in the dead of night and to bring Philip and the others across the water. But these people are stateless. They have been banished. They have surname, and they are certainly not 
royalty. Back in Britain, the marriage goes ahead. And George says, well, OK, there's not a lot I can do about it. Uh, but the wonderful thing is that you haven't got a surname, old chum, so at least your family can't nick the House of Windsor. Um, also, since you have no royal status and you are internationally banished and your father is under charge of treason, you cannot even be a prince in my country. So you will never be a prince in Britain. Prince Philip does not exist. He was given the title Duke of Edinburgh, and the only reason he couldn't be Prince of Scotland like we have a Prince of Wales is because the House of Stuart has always been Princes of Scotland. Duke of Edinburgh was the best they could give him. He then queued up after the war, and for 10 shillings, he bought himself a British passport, along with refugees from all over Europe. He still didn't have a surname. He took his uncle's name of Battenberg, which in the meantime had been changed to Mount Batten because that didn't sound quite so German at, in a, at a, a dodgy time. So we now have Philip Mount Batten. Now then a very strange thing begins to happen because what people forget was that Philip's uncle, Earl Mount Batten of Burma, was a very, very powerful person internationally. Um, in, in naval terms, he was Lord of the Admiralty. Powerful man. So he immediately comes forward, and we're now in 1947, and said, OK, this family has to become the House of Mount Batten. Not necessarily from the time that Philip and Elizabeth marry, or even from the time that she inherits the throne, but from the time that their first son or offspring inherits, it, inherits this will be the House of Mount Batten. Now, this was actually a problem for, for Parliament and for everybody else. Um, the problem was that all of the heraldic colleges, all of the colleges of arms in Britain, be it in Scotland, England, or wherever, agreed with Old Mount Batten and said, well, we don't actually like you or the idea very much, but yes, legally, you are correct. Well, anyway, the battle went on and the battle went on. Winston Churchill sort of saved the day and there was a bit of paying off going on and the thing went very quiet. And Earl Mountbatten knew that it wasn't going to matter at all anyway until Charles, the eldest son or whoever, became king. Which might be soon or it might not be soon. In fact, he might not be king for a long time. So the first time he actually has to begin to make any noise about it is when Charles marries and produces an heir. So we're now moving towards the Diana period. Earl Mountbatten is still on the scene. Earl Mountbatten is waiting to turn this into a, a coup and to get it back to being the house of Mountbatten, which he feels sounds still a good deal nicer and more German than Windsor. So we come to 1979, by which time plans are already afoot for Charles to marry Diana. Although we in the public Field didn't hear about it at that time, and they didn't get married until 81. The plans were afoot in 79, at which time Earl Mountbatten of Burma, De Bretz, Burke's Peerage, and all the colleges rose up again and said, hey guys, House of Mountbatten on the way, because these people will have a son. Well, the argument prevailed, and the argument raged, and legally everybody knew that Earl Mountbatten of Burma was correct. Charles had been strategically married into the Spencer line to clean up the blood. They were suffering from all sorts of problems, impotency, haemophilia, all the things that had happened because of too much very close interbreeding within the family. Um, but Diana's job was simply to produce an heir. However, Mountbatten saw what had happened was a door had been opened and the house of Mountbatten was now on the horizon. Wrong. He was, very strangely, blown up in his boat, and that was the end of him. And for a lot of years, they blamed the IRA. And nobody could actually quite understand why the IRA should want to blow up Mount Batten. You know, there's plenty of politicians and people they would have really have done it to. But nobody understood that, and they always said it wasn't us. In fact, nasty people as we may be, we terrorists of the IRA lunatic fringe, we would always tell you when we blew somebody up, otherwise there's no point in us doing it. You wouldn't know it was us. 
I mean, we would gain nothing. In fact, if we managed to do a job like that, we would be really proud that we've been that clever, and we certainly make sure that you knew, but actually, sorry, it wasn't us. <laughs> well, in fact, it was only a very few years ago that the government finally announced that they knew it wasn't the IRA. Well, the only way they could know it wasn't the IRA is to actually know who it was, and of course they knew who it was right from the start. And from that moment, scenes of old-time history began to come to people's minds, and you could see that, that this element of politics, this element of if they don't go quietly, if they don't agree with our dogmas and our arguments, we'll make jolly sure that they're not around for too long and they won't get in our way for any longer than we can help. So from that moment, you could almost predict, and this is from 1980, that Diana would not have a very successful time. Okay. Hi. He's going to ask me for the history of the world now, aren't you? No. <laughs> no, actually, I was going to ask you for a little bit of the history of the princes, the Council of Princes. Mm -hmm. You talked quite a bit about uh, bringing that, the, uh, the bloodline to date. And here in this school, we, we make a distinction between the, the physical body and the bloodline and its genetic potential and who's occupying it. Right. Okay. The route to kingship comes from only one source. The route to kingship is only messiahship, dragonship. The sovereign earthling line of monarchy is the line that we talked about today. Now this line, of course, has spread its branches throughout history and become all sorts of royal and noble houses, some of whom from time to time have held crowns and thrones in Europe, and many who never have. The interesting thing is that whenever one is looking at key aspects of this line, whether you're looking at the Merovingians in France or the Royal House of Stuart in Scotland for that matter, these families eventually get knocked out of position by the church or the other parliamentary establishments because they follow a grail code rule of the monarch is there to serve the people. Whereas, in fact, the rule actually is the monarch is there to serve the church and the church-controlled parliament. So it hasn't had the greatest success in history as reigning monarchs, but it has had an amazing success in history as princes in the background, and certainly as monarchs when they get the chance to be monarchs for a while. The European Council of Princes is comprised not only of princes of that particular bloodline or the particular strains of it, but of some offshoot branches of it as well. And remember, they weren't all there in the 15 and 16 and 1700s taking star fire. Those days were long gone. So the families have become very much like ordinary people. It's just that from time to time, it is very apparent when you've got a very clean route in the line because the stories in that line, and this is where Diana comes from, whether they're out of royalty or in royalty, their tradition, and it's generally in a female line rather than a male line, is a very strong one, a very powerful one when it comes to serving people. These are true grail queens. What I love about the Diana story is that she's actually now become the Lady of the Lake because where they've buried her. The Council of Princes was founded in 1946, immediately after the war, and it comprised, with the exception of the House of Windsor, every royal house in Europe. Um, there are now other royal families coming in. The House of uh, Romanov, Russian house, is, is just joining now. The House of Napoleon is coming on board now. So there are other lines that aren't necessarily bloodline royalty that are coming on board with the Council of Princes. Its money was achieved originally from here, America, in 1946. And with Grand Duke Otto of Austria, von Habsburg, as its president, it sat as a committee with the objective of constraining either further rise of Nazi type regimes in the West or 
of restraining the rise of communism in the West. And America funded this, and the Council of Princes became that institution. They were at that time actually called the International Council of Government. So if you look into the US Senate archives and see the International Council of Government, that's who they are. However, they could only operate on one basis, and the basis was simply this, and the Americans understood it, because the Americans said, what you have to do to make sure that these things don't take place in your country is to become champions of your country's individual written constitutions. To uphold those constitutions, not to uphold your aristocracies and parliament, and to say whenever a parliament or the church or the aristocracy want to do something that impinges upon the rights, liberties, freedoms and welfare of the people, sorry, you can't do that, the constitution says so. Now they have done that very successfully since 1946 in every country except Britain, and the House of Windsor have declined every year to join the council because we do not have a written constitution. We're the only country in the civilized Western world that does not. Why? Because, just like George I couldn't speak English or write English, we are a parliamentary controlled society, and that is where it will remain until somebody changes the monarchical system in Britain and gives us a written constitution. And most of my work, apart from talking about my books, is done in the political field, talking about the importance of written constitutions, particularly in Britain, and the rewriting of some of the European runs to bring them up to date. Britain does not have a written constitution. Britain is in the European Union with other countries. The International Council of Government had to change its name when the European Parliament came about because there seemed to be a sort of a conflict. So suddenly, the people of these countries became aware of who was behind this International Council of Government because they didn't actually know it was the sons and the daughters of royal houses, be they ruling, ruling houses or not. And it became the European Council of Princes in 1992. And that was exactly the year that I was taken on board as the presidential attaché to the council. It was actually because of my presidential attaché to the council that I got access to archives that other people wouldn't have and was able to write Bloodline of the Holy Grail because these are the archives that give us the messianic line all the, way back, <coughs> all the way back to Jesus. So, who are they, what are they? They are royal houses who may be of or may not be of the direct royal bloodline who uphold and champion written constitutions on behalf of the people of those countries, in a nutshell. Short. Hello, you have to jump <laughs> up to that one. How are we doing for time? One more? Thank you. This will um, have to be the last one, I'm told. We're running on a bit. Okay. Betty by this time. Did you find an impetus that caused the Egyptians to seek another source of the star fire rather than keep on using the ritual of the scarlet women? Yeah. And, two part, um, what um, were they both? men and women that then became these alchemists that used the gold, and did women ever consume the star fire? Mm. Yeah. Um, the reason that the Egyptians had the priestess scarlet women in the first place was because they were never involved in the original Anunnaki star fire practice. They inherited the custom in Egypt and had to create a vehicle for it, and this vehicle became the, the, these priestesses. These were highly bred people, and, and again, I suspect that they, they lived particularly constrained lifestyles and had special diets and whatever, so that they were um, as good as they could be. But ultimately, what they were was very high specimens of the human race. They weren't actually Anunnaki. Um, so in effect, the... the Although the, the starfire ritual was being played out, and in fact, the starfire ritual gave the kingly line the root to the starfire, the extract from menstrual blood, whatever it was they did, what they were actually doing was getting a little bit of a hormone boost, but that was it. I mean, it wasn't doing anything magnificently to them. They were just getting a bit of a hormone boost. Um, what, what, what happened was that it seemed far more sensible to forget the ritual. And this is what's so interesting about this, because even in those days, they understood that times change, things change. Sometimes you have to think again, and the old dogmas and customs must go. 
Unfortunately, for 3,000 and 4,000 years since that, the church has not learned this lesson. But at that moment in time, they knew it, and they said, okay, that was yesterday's history, but at least we've, we've learned that production of these hormones does amazing things for people. What we need is a way of making people make more of these hormones for themselves. We need something that will actually shunt those glands into action and make them produce more stuff. Um, now, this was produced out of very expensive substances. We're talking about platinums and golds and things, so it wasn't exactly something for everybody. Um, this was for the kingly line. Um, so they, they didn't exactly sacrifice it for something less. They sacrificed it for something better. Yeah? I've forgotten the second part of your question. It was so long ago. Uh, did, did women also, were they also... Oh, yeah, that's right. I guess so. Um, the theory behind it was that the importance of the gene moved through the, the female line. Um, in essence, they were talking about mitochondrial DNA, which, which is an inheritance, in fact, not just through the female line, but moves from mother to daughter, um, which is an interesting one. Um, which is why it, it was kind of important to marry your sister, but more important to marry a sister who was a daughter of your mother than it was to marry a daughter of your father. So you find that a lot of the Egyptian pharaohs, in particular, married sisters, daughters of their mother, but not necessarily of, of their father, the pharaoh. So that, in fact, that was where the line came in and created the next pharaoh from, but then there had to be from that mother another daughter by a different father. So they're always marrying half-sisters, not, not full-sisters. But yes, they would have been fed it, they would have had it, because that they were really the key to it. Um, it, it would have been essential that they were in a, as heightened a physical capacity as possible. Okay. Oh. That seems to be about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot.